Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Rosenberger, and I'm the Director of Advocacy and External Engagement at Twin Cities or Greater Twin Cities United Way. So again, just thanks for being here today and happy. Certainly the first day of fall uh, is upon us here. And, um, you know, it's really fun to, to see the activities that you've shared. Uh, fall is certainly my favorite season of the year. Um, but I guess as a drawback, it always seems to go so fast and end way too quickly. So <laughs> um, again, it's wonderful to have you join us uh, and coming together as donors in the community, as partners to learn about our collaboration to address the important topic today of youth wellness and mental health. And we host these community connection series events every other month um, to share the impact, ideas, opportunities, how together we can disrupt inequity and fuel change in our region. So really our objective today is to bring you closer to our work and create uh, deep dive conversations on pressing community issues and United Way's strategic response. So before we get started, I just want to uh, note a few housekeeping items, uh, probably most <laughs> importantly, if you're experiencing any technical issues now or anytime throughout the event, uh, please feel free to email Karen Lesser. Um, why don't we go ahead and put her information there. Um, you'll see it both on the PowerPoint slide as well as in the chat. Um, and you can also direct message her within Zoom if you'd like to. Um, a few different additional details. This session is being recorded um, and please remain on mute and leave your video off. Let's go to the next slide. So here's how we're gonna spend the next hour together. First, uh, Liz Williams, one of our program officers here at Greater Twin Cities United Way is going to introduce us to the work that she's leading alongside several of our partners to address youth uh, wellness and mental health. And it's truly a really relevant topic and one that's been, uh, I think, seeing increasing urgency. We've all probably seen this in the media. Um, and in our communities. And in part, it's definitely due to the many challenges facing youth um, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. But I think it's something we've also been seeing rising even before the pandemic. So we're gonna take a deeper dive into this issue to better understand the realities facing today's youth and how United Way is working with our partners to effectively support their wellness. So today's session is gonna host, a, I'm sure, a vibrant and informative discussion with several of these key partners, um, including Amina Salad, who's the program leader with WellShare International, Maria Padilla, a health and wellness educator with Centro Tyrone Guzman, and Carolina de los Rios, a program officer for mental health and suicide prevention here at Greater Twin Cities United Way. So I just wanna extend a warm welcome to Liz and all of our panelists. And then finally, we'll host some time for a Q&A at the end of today's session. So please feel free to post your questions anytime. I'll be monitoring the chat, so I'll share your questions with our speakers following the, pan uh, the panel discussion at the end of today. And now as a community impact team, um, we practice before each session. Um, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that these are the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of additional peoples. We are on Dakota lands in Minnesota Makoche, which is land where the water reflects the sky or water trees and all living things coming out of the ground carry with them the spirit of the Dakota people, because quite literally this ground is saturated with the DNA of the ancestors who lived here for millennia. The land was ceded from the Dakota in the treaties of 1837 and 1851, and we acknowledge the complex and multi-layered history that included violence and trauma. This land continues to hold great historical and spiritual significance and remains sacred for many people. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm tribal sovereignty and the Greater Twin Cities United Way is committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for sovereign tribal nations and indigenous people of the state of Minnesota and across the United States. So why don't we go to the next slide. Uh, so now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Liz Williams. So uh, I will turn off my camera. Liz, welcome to the program. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, so like Kristen said, my name is Liz Williams. I'm a program officer here at Greater Twin Cities United Way, and I work on our community impact team where I co-lead one of our education uh, innovation initiatives. 
So as an educator myself and as someone with two teenagers at home, I am so grateful to all of you for being here today and for your interest in youth well-being and mental health. I do wanna take a pause before we dive into the topic today to just acknowledge that um, today's session will cover some difficult and possibly emotional topics. So if you or someone you know is in crisis, there are options available to help you cope. You can call the Suicide Prevention Hotline, Lifeline at any time to speak to someone and to get that support. So confidential support is available 24 seven to everyone in the United States. Um, and we'll drop more information in the chat. And again, thank you all for being here in community with us today. We can go to the next slide. So let's start here. Why youth wellness and why now? Kristen did a little bit of a setup um, at the start of the session, but let's just place ourselves in this sort of moment in time. So as students go back to school and familiar routines for many are reestablished, students are still carrying with them the impact of 18 months of an ongoing global pandemic and civil unrest. The return to school this fall is a critical transition point for youth and should really be a reflection point for us as adults to listen and amplify what is working for young people. At Greater Twin Cities United Way over the last 18 months, we've been listening to our community to inform our funding and strategy, speaking directly with young people and families. And what we've heard is that amidst, amidst the disruption and economic hardship, the mental health and wellness of young people continues to be a top priority in line with other basic needs like food and housing. In addition, our direct service programs like 211 and the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which I mentioned uh, in my introduction, give us real-time information on how youth and their families are experiencing life right now. And again, mental health and how to support young people is a top concern in our community. Through the multiple touch points that we have at the United Way, it's clear that youth wellness now more than ever is a core component of supporting young people in their social, emotional, and academic lives. And next slide. So at the Greater Twin Cities United Way, we work toward disrupting inequities based on race, place, and income. And we envision a world where young people develop a strong sense of self, as well as a sense of community and connectedness in their neighborhoods. We know that this happens both in school and outside of school. And from direct service through 211 to nonprofit partnerships, such as our 95 multi-year grantee relationships, we seek to support the urgent needs of today and work toward a more equitable tomorrow. And we employ multiple lovers to achieve this vision. So in our multi-year portfolio, we invest in out-of-time school, out school time programs in our career and future readiness portfolio. And we'll have the opportunity today to hear from a couple of those organizations. We also strengthen and support the nonprofit sector by connecting leaders, bridging gaps in the system, and amplifying our nonprofit partners. The Greater Twin Cities United Way is also uniquely positioned to advocate for long-term sustainable change informed by community. And in fact, we believe that when we unite as change makers, we can create equitable solutions, shift narratives, and drive lasting change in our community. And lastly, within our innovation work, we invest in promising practices with the potential for big impact. So one example of that is that during COVID-19, we rapidly deployed funds aimed at holistic support for students in both the St. Paul North End and Phillips neighborhoods for basic needs, academic services, and mental health support. And today, during the panel, we'll have a chance to hear from Centro Tyrone Guzman, who was a recipient of these timely and targeted funds. Next slide. So we see this moment in time as an opportunity to holistically meet the needs of young people in our community. And many of the organizations we work with are already using proven practices with some of these core components you see here. So first, listening to youth. We believe in giving youth the power to determine their own future, but also offering guidance and support and an authentic decision-making seat at the table. We also know that the most effective programs are culturally relevant, community-centered, and powered by youth. And lastly, we know that there are so many organizations already doing great work with families, but to create sustainable change for young people and families in our region, the United Way connects and amplifies the many spots of excellence, brings the right people to the table, and pushes for equitable change and a unified system of support in our community. And at today's session, we have the privilege to hear from community experts, including the United Way, who bring these elements to life and envision a future where everyone in our community can thrive. Go ahead and move to the next slide. So now we get to start with the panel discussion. So we'll move into a discussion with our panel of experts today. Uh, we'll be introducing them each individually and then move into a whole panel discussion followed by time for audience question and answer. And so we hope that you will engage in the chat if something comes up for you, a thought or a question 
um, feel free to utilize the chat and we'll, we'll return to those questions um, toward the end of the panel. So our first panelist, I'm very excited to introduce, um, Amina Salad is an after-school program leader with Wellshare International. Using a community health worker model, Wellshare reduces health disparities by re reaching underserved communities to promote health, prevent disease, and increase access to health services. Wellshare International works with refugee and Im immigrant communities in Minnesota and with underserved rural populations in East Africa. Their programs address the health needs of individuals across the lifespan, including pregnant women, infants, children, youth, adults, and the elderly. Wellshare International is currently funded in our career and future readiness portfolio. Amina leads programs at Wellshare International and holds a master's degree in public health. She finds inspiration in seeing the youth she works with grow from young people to young adults. Amina, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Liz, for that introduction. I'm happy to be here. Great. Well, let's get started. So can you share a little bit about how you and the young people you work with have been experiencing the last 18 months or so? Yeah, um, I think we can all agree that um, the disruption that the pandemic caused in our lives has impacted us um, adults and young people. Um, in ways that we have not experienced before. So for me, the past 18 months has been difficult to say the least um, because there are a lot of uncertain things and it was scary to think that I would lose a lot of loved ones and family members. So um, worrying about that caused a lot of anxiety for me. And um, I wanna say that for the youth and young people that I work with, it was um, the same experience for them. It was similar uh, because many of them have a lot of elderly um, grandparents living at home because in our culture, grandparents usually live with uh, one of their children often like when uh, they, as they get older, one of their, ch their children will take care of them. So during our weekly sessions, youth would come and voice their worry, worry like wor th that they're worrying about, uh, they're, they're worried for their grandparents who are living with them. And they're also worried about their future, them themse um, themselves, they are, um, that it was affecting their mental health and feeling like um, they were stuck at home, um, doing the same daily routine over and over again, not seeing their friends. So they were struggling with um, to cope with that. Um, I remember one of them actually telling me that uh, he struggled with social anxiety and he thought that the lockdown would, would help him because he didn't have to socialize anymore. But he said that, that actually the lockdown actually made his um, situ like his condition worse. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, I think one of the things that you had mentioned to me too earlier was just around um, how individual the experience has been for each of us. There's some shared experience, but that when we think about young people, um, that it's really an individualized experience and, and every, every young person is unique in that way. Yes. Um, so there is no um, one experience that are, that are shared among youth. Each one has their own unique um, their own unique like experience and you have to uh, you have to like talk to them individually and find out their needs individually and you can't you can't go off of what what one of them said and apply that to the next one you have to know um, which which like what each and every one of them is going through thank you so much um, we'll come back to that a little bit later too so our next panelist is Maria Padilla. Maria Padilla is a family educator with Centro Tyrone Guzman. She's a respected leader and an advocate in the Latine community who has worked at Centro for an incredible 23 years. As a doula and centering pregnancy facilitator, she has supported many mothers through their pregnancy and the beautiful birth of their babies. As a host of Hablando de Salud, Maria promoted the health of Latine families. As a graduate of the Shannon Institute Lola, she's committed to listening intently and compassionately making connections, providing resources, and providing information to parents so future generations can thrive. 
Centro Tyrone Guzman is currently funded in our Career and Future Readiness portfolio and was one of eight grantees awarded rapid fun funding from the Greater Twin Cities United Way in our COVID Student Support and Family Empowerment Grants. Because of this support, Centro delivered the Circulo de Seguridad, which is a training pro provided to Latine families that offers relationship tools to provide parents and caregivers with a new way of identifying and understanding children's needs. There is so much that we can celebrate about this program, but I, I do wanna share one um, exciting uh, outcome from that program. And that is that 100% of the 76 participants of that program are implementing changes in their own behavior that help them to support their children's needs. And as a parent, that's a very exciting and, and important um, outcome of that program. So Maria, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. And really, I am so excited to share about this program because it was amazing really to run that program. And this program is so effective because it has been tasted for five decades and it can be adapted to the needs of any community. We adapt it to the Latino community, uh, providing in groups in Spanish and thinking about the specific needs uh, of the participants. Uh, the facilitators, we have the same cultural background and uh, the same uh, or, or similar social economic background, or we are very familiar with the program. Uh, so this allowed us to, to provide them best support uh, to, to have the better uh, possible support for the participants. In the circles of security, uh, parents learn they are the role models and they will support their kids as they explore, explore the, the world. After exploring, children will return safely to the adults and the adult listen, protects and guides. Parents are support and raise their kids in a positive caring environment. This environment may be different from the environment parents were raised in. For example, parents make time to talk with their kids uh, and even if they, have, they are very busy working in two jobs. In the groups, parents learn children sometimes misbehave to attract attention. They are seeking connection with the parents. When parents understand this, in a state of raising the, their voices, uh, they calmly sit uh, and talk to their children and listening to them, to their needs. In the group, parents share with us uh, and each another, they realize how they brought up influences and in how they were raising their children. They understand that they can change this and support their children's battles. So it has been a very successful program. Thank you so much, Maria. I think what I what I hear from you is just around this approach that for myself as a as a former educator was was kind of like an aha of we we often talk about what we can do for the for the individual young person or the student without really thinking about them as part of, um, I think, a, a bigger family unit. And so really appreciate that part of the program. All right, I'm going to move to our next panelist, uh, my colleague, Carolina de los Rios, who is a program officer of mental health and suicide prevention at the Greater Twin Cities United Way. Carolina oversees the Suicide Prevention Lifeline program responsible for providing free and con confidential suicide risk assessment, emotional support, crisis intervention, and linkages to local treatment and support resources, including emergency services. The Greater Twin Cities United Way Suicide Prevention Lifeline is part of the National Suicide Prevention Network, which includes more than 180 crisis centers located in communities across the country. Carolina has over 14 years of experience overseeing social services and mental health programs for survivors of trauma in Washington, DC. And prior to joining the United Way, she was the Director of Social Services at Ayuda, and prior to that, the Director of Survivor Services at Polaris. Carolina holds a doctorate in language, literacy and culture and a master's degree in counseling psychology, as well as a bachelor's degree in clinical psychology. She holds a graduate certificate in professional counseling studies and is currently in the doctorate program in counseling and psychology at St. Thomas University. Hi, Carolina, thank you so much for being here with us Hi. today. Hi. So as both a professional expert in mental health and from what you're seeing in real time through the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, what have you seen change in how adults are approaching youth wellness and mental health over the last you know, 18 months to a couple of years? Thank you. Thank you, Liz, for, for the introduction and for the opportunity to have this conversation with the community. Um, I think that the big uh, 
trend that we're seeing. And I think it's also a question and a reflection for our group and, and everyone that is, is part of the community right now in this virtual setting is um, that we had identified that there is a tendency to place the responsibility on the youth as an attempt to pathologize anything that is happening with that youth. So behaviors, unwanted behaviors, emotions, feelings, um, there is a response. And I think a lot of people coming with great intentions to try to support that youth, but from the perspective of there is something wrong with you. And, and the approach is to pathologize that. So if there is an unwanted behavior, we have to diagnose that and we have to put a name and a label and therefore find a cure or a treatment so that youth can be changed or that behavior can be changed or that emotion can be transformed. And, and, and what we hear um, from our youth scholars in the lifeline is that they basically are feeling disconnected. And I think Amina, uh, uh, was sharing with, with us on how uh, their participants in her program, uh, they feel about it. And this feeling of disconnect is definitely something that we hear every day from our callers. Um, they're, they're, the youth are disconnected from their families, from any adult in their communities. For that effect, they don't feel connected with the school counselors. They don't feel connected with any adult in their communities. And basically when they are starting to feel this disconnect, this isolation, these feelings start kind of bottling up and they don't have anyone to talk about it. Um, and, and the problem here is, so we see on one end, um, as a community, we're pathologizing everything that is technically wrong with that youth, uh, or with our community of youth. Two, the youth feel disconnected and don't feel that they have the opportunity of the outlet or anyone in their community, a mentor, anyone that they can talk to about what they're going through. And this, unfortunately, and that's how it reached our crisis line, leads to youth connecting with us with suicidal ideation, with suicidal behaviors, and already with a plan on how to end their lives. And, and this is where basically as a community if you think about it we should rather working on prevention than in intervention and that's kind of my personal and professional approach is we should invest in prevention why do we want to get to the level of intervention and when they call our lifeline they're already at the point that many of them and, and i'm talking about 12 years old nine years old already with a plan on how to kill themselves and um my apologies to the audience. If you feel that this is um, making you feel uncomfortable, please feel free to reach out to um, to Liz on the chat. Uh, I'll take a quick break, but I think it is important to be able to have these conversations in the way that we hear them. And, and this is what we're hearing from the community in, in our lifeline and what we see um, that our youth are experiencing. Um, so when they connect with us in the lifeline, as I mentioned, some of them already have a plan. And, and when we inquire a little bit more about what is going on in their communities with their families, if there's anyone in their family that they can talk to about these feelings, the answer 80% of the time is no. I don't feel comfortable talking to my mother about this. I don't feel comfortable talking to anyone in my family about this. When we inquire about maybe connecting with a school counselor, do you have someone in the school that you can talk to? most of the time, and, and uh, I wanna make sure that when I say most of the time in the context of our lifeline, I don't wanna generalize this and put it on the entire community. This is what we hear from our callers. The answer is always no, I don't feel I can trust anyone. Um, so this is a question that I put back to everyone. Why is that? Why is that our youth are really not finding that connection in the community with anyone, even at the point when we are actually thinking about ending their lives? How is that there is no one that they can talk to that they basically prefer to call a toll free number, our crisis line to be able to talk to someone and finally being able to say what they're going through. Um, so I think that is definitely an issue of trust that we need to think about. What is going on that as a community, we're not building that trust with our youth and, and basically we're letting that gap to widen and widen and uh, to the point that they're feeling pretty isolated. So what Amina was referring uh, in her uh, presentation, obviously COVID brought and exacerbated that feeling of isolation, right? And that feeling of fear and not being able to connect with friends or whatnot. 
But if we think about it, this was not created by COVID itself. This was happening already. COVID exacerbated something that was already happening in the communities. And, and what Maria was mentioning about the, the, the group of parents, I think this is where we're talking about prevention, right? I mean, how can we build communities from the beginning with the trust? So our youth actually have someone to talk to when these hard feelings and these feelings of isolation and these feelings of this, of, of feeling unwanted, uh, when the self-esteem is so low, who can they talk about it, right? Um, so I think from what we have heard and from my experience, I really, really strongly believe that the response has to be from the community. I think we have to really take a strong stand on stopping pathologizing our youth, our youth behaviors, our youth emotions, and really trying to see this in the context of what is really causing this, right? So someone, Amina or Maria mentioned uh, about that, um, they sometimes they just want to get the attention, right? That they're like overreacting of their son unwanted behavior, so they want to get attention of the parents. And uh, we have to question ourselves of what is going on when we see these emotions, these symptoms, this behavior continually being present in the youth in our communities. It's not about let's go and fix them, let's go about um, and send them um, so they can get medicated so the symptom is, is goes away. Um, absolutely, we need to, to take an interdisciplinary approach with doctors, psychologists, uh, social workers, community educators to look into this, but it's not only one approach and it not, can be just fixed by medicating someone's symptoms. Um, so I, I want you to, to think about that and I really, and I think this is what it becomes the work of all of us at the community. And I think that's why sometimes the approach is not that popular because it means we all have to get involved to find that solution and it's not like the cure, the one uh, medication, the what pill that is gonna solve the situation in that particular Jew. Um, I don't know, Liz, if you want me to sort of like pause in here to, to, yeah. to get a little bit of that feedback. Yeah, thank you so much, Carolina, for that. And I think that um, you've, you've kind of set up where we were hoping to bring the first question to the whole panel, um, which is really as, as this group of experts and people who are closest to the work, uh, what would you say is one thing that needs to change? And like Carolina said, there is not, you know, like a one sort of magic option here, but really just from your perspective and expertise, what is one thing that needs to change so that you do have access to responsive, culturally relevant, um, Carolina, as you put it, kind of communi community informed programming? And I mean, I'd like to start with you. Thank you, Liz. Um, I think to culturally tailor like a program or um, anything to youth, we need to listen to them and design it according to their input and um, and constantly get their feedback to improve it for them. And because I believe that a program like for youth, it needs to be designed by them and it needs to be by youth. Um, and to ensure like their engagement and um, that they're interested in the program, it has it can't be a one size fits all program. It has to have components that interest um, each and every one of them. So, uh, for example, our after school programming includes a component where um, we have youth led projects where they're able to take the lead on the projects and um, take them where they would like. And we're just there as staff. We are just there to support them and guide them when they need it. Thank you for that. Maria, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, definitely, we need support for culturally specific organizations that, that can work with teens uh, and their parents in their native language in, uh, with a cultural specific. Uh, we need a staff that have the same cultural background and families and understand their challenges and opportunities uh, with the diverse of a uh, families, the socioeconomic background that they have. And, and yeah, I have, I have seen the connection with the teens and the RISES program in Centro, how they feel so connected with the, with the, uh, all the people that we are working there because it's the same language and they feel like, okay, this is like my second home and, and they, it's what they really need to find a place where they feel connected and they feel loved. 
Thanks, Maria. Carolina, would you, is there anything that you would add that you didn't get to um, earlier? No, I think I, the, uh, I echo what Amina and Maria said. Thanks. So as part of our COVID uh, relief response, so we'll do a little bit of a shift here. At United Way, we deployed a strategy and funding focused on student support and family empowerment. Um, and I'm hoping, Maria, that you could tell us a little bit about the impact of the support that you re received from the United Way amidst the pandemic in 2020. Yeah, de definitely. The timing for us to start the circle of security couldn't have been better because parents were so afraid of violence, of, this, uh, of the economic situation in some of them homeless. Uh, they were transmitting this stress and worry to their kids. Children then were even worse, uh, more upset and had difficult to, for them to cope this. As parents, we were able to face the challenge uh, about what they have, but their children, uh, they, they now feel safer when their parents, they can feel more, uh, know what, what about how to face their, their difficulties and the respect uh, and we're able to trust and feel safe with their parents, the kids, they will feel safer. Parents also understand that they need to heal to really help their kids. Thanks, Maria. So I'm wondering, Carolina, if you could share a little bit about, um, from your perspective, again, as, as an expert, but then also as someone who's seeing some of the themes in community um, in real time, why it matters to have an organization like the United Way connecting the dots and moving system-wide solutions forward. Oh, Carolina, you are on mute. Uh, sorry. Um, I think it, we are in a unique position uh, to be able to learn from the communities as we are hearing directly from the callers that connect with our lifeline and, and we are learning from the community partners. I think um, it is very important to keep the notion of this is a community response. We learn from our participants, our callers, our clients. However, it is what we do with that, what we learn from, from those, right? So we, we are learning from our callers uh, that they are basically just being left um, alone in a system where they don't feel that they're getting the, the, their, meet, their needs are getting met. So I think it matters that we are trying to connect those dots who are those who are part of the system that are serving the youth, right? Um, the school system, the, the foster care, the healthcare system, what is happening um, in those gaps? Who are filling in, in those gaps? Um, we as a community members now, we're learning from all of you um, in, in the organizations, from our callers, what are we going to do to be able to fill into those gaps so we don't end up talking to youth in our lifeline that are planning to end their lives. So I think, I mean, I just want to write today this because we're talking about that our youth, 12 to 20 years old, are thinking about suicide. So what are we going to do about, uh, as a community to respond to that? How we're gonna, and I think Amina um, or uh, Maria just say something really powerful at the end of your last um, segment, and it's like parents need to heal to be able to help their children, right? And I think I will take it even further. Communities, adults, the adults in the communities, all of us need to heal to be able to help and to provide the support services for the youth. So we have to actually look at ourselves as a community member. So actually, what, what do we need to do? What is the work that we need to do um, internally to be able to be that, that support for the youth? that basically are hurting right now, that many are thinking of suicide, and what is the response? So, so we definitely, I think that is the importance of us being able to connect the dots and to bring the hard questions to the community, to ourselves, to that effect. Thank you for that, Carolina. I think, yeah, and I would just add that we, um, at the United Way, one of the reasons that um, we decided that we needed this type of session and to draw, draw attention and highlight some of these uh, innovative programs and community was through what Carolina was has been sharing today um, and really sort of be having the ability to see the landscape and, and ring an alarm in some ways too um, of the needs in community. 
So the final question I have for the panel before we have the opportunity to move to audience questions. Um, and I, one thing I've appreciated that all of you today have really been speaking to the adults um, and, and, and less about what young people need to fix and do. So I've really appreciated that. And our last question for you um, before we move to the Q&A, what do you wish adults understood and better appreciated about what it is meant to be a young person right now? And I mean, I would love to start with you. Thank you. Um, I think it's to not dismiss them when they're talking as being too young to really listen to them, take the time to listen to them and take them seriously. Um, that means a lot to them and it makes them more confident and it encourages them to speak up more and tell you um, what they are feeling and what they would like. And um, for example, in the past year, some of our after school um, youth participants were uh, were able to co-lead a research project on tobacco use among Somali youth. And some of the things that they were able to do was facilitate uh, focus group discussions. Um, they did everything from like developing the questions, um, recruiting participants, and also leading the discussions of the uh, group discussion. Um, but in the beginning, they all doubted their ability to do so. And um, but with little support and encouragement, they rose to the occasion. So making them feel like they're heard and um, their opinions are valued and encouraged them goes a long way and means a lot to a young person, so. Thank you for that. Maria, what would you say? Oh, yeah, I, I really agree with Amina, but yeah, uh, like a youth in our programs are very bright and they are struggling like us. They are feeling insulated. Virtual learning is difficult. Teens have uh, find a hard time to interact with other students when they communicate through the screens. Uh, things many times have little communication with the parents, so they do not uh, feel that their support. Sometimes family live in small places, uh, and siblings are sharing one room to make. Uh, it makes very difficult to attend classes. However, they make the best what, what, whatever they have. And, and really, our job is to support parents so they can support their teens. Absolutely. Thanks, Maria. Carolina, um, what would you say about what you wish adults understood or better appreciated about what it means to be a young person right now? Um, I think, I mean, I will, I will want to, for all of us to remind ourselves what was to be um, a teenager. So kind of like um, from the liberation psychology perspective, uh, there is a very nice quote that it says, you are my other me, right? So when I look at you as a young person, you are my other me. I was you at some point, so let's just not forget that, right? Let's just not forget that we were young at some point. And even though the circumstances of today's world poses very, very different challenges to our youth, we need to be able to promote that empowerment and that resilience in our youth. And to be able to do that, we got to be able to be, to engage in radical humility and radical empathy. I just cannot stress it enough. We cannot come from a position of power. I'm the adult and I'm going to tell you what to do uh, because then this is not the way that we're going to build that trust and that connection. Thank you so much, Carolina. I think, um, Kristen, if you're ready, if I can't see the chat at the moment, but if there are questions from the chat, we'll move to audience questions now. Yeah, well, I just want to thank you so much, Liz, I mean, uh, Marie and Carolina for sharing your shared perspectives and reflective insights. I think it's just really powerful for us to just sort of um, think about this and, and the sort of inspiration that you're sharing with us, as well as some dark and tough truths um, of what's happening with our youth today. Um, and we've certainly covered a lot of ground, talked about critically important need to advance thoughtful, coordinated and strategic supports to address, address youth wellness. Um, I just wanna take a second before we move on to acknowledge the heavy weight and sensitivity surrounding mental health and just to challenge ourselves to reflect within this vulnerable space, which often affects so many of us or the ones that we love. 
so that we can really um, pivot and make the change that we need. So again, I wanted to open up the floor to invite questions um, of our attendees. Um, please feel free to post your questions in the chat. I'm gonna be monitoring them. Um, I'll tee up the first question. Uh, thank you very much to Akua. Um, this one is for Amina and she, you know, I think you really talked about how important it is to center this work um, within a youth voice and perspective. And Akua's question is really, you know, how have you seen programs differing in their design when they're planned by youth versus maybe staff, adult staff, um, and how those showed up previously? Um, thank you, that's a great question. I think um, when the programs are designed by youth and when you give them um, the, like just the floor to take the lead on uh, on programs, they really enjoy what they're doing instead of um, you telling them, I need you to do this, 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 and that. Um, when they are coming up with the activities and when they are um, doing, taking the project where they like, they really enjoy to, uh, um, to do the, the work that they're doing instead of something that's designed for them and they're given into and told to um, do. Yeah, I've got two teenagers myself, so I, I get that. They like to lead. <laughs> do you have maybe just a, a quick follow-up? Do you maybe have an example of something that they have planned together that is kind of exciting or they've been excited about? Um, we did a photo voice project that um, they came up with the ideas of what kind of pictures that they wanted to take and um, just like giving them the freedom to um, just do whatever they want. And they came up with a lot of great ideas, took a lot of great pictures. And it's not, it's not something that's not related to the project and um, the work that needed to be done, but it's, it was just really fun to see their ideas come to life um, with the Photo Voice Project. Thanks. That's fun to see that, like you say, come to life. It's very uh, rewarding for them, I'm sure, and your program. Um, there's another question from Carrie, and just wanted to uh, see if, you know, you know, we've seen this in the news a lot, but I think that there's a lot of awareness about mental health issues, connecting children to resources. Are there ways that you've seen schools um, step up into that space or things that um, you know, we've seen them do or you're partnered with um, to help bring those to life and bring that into sort of those different facets of where they spend their day? I'm wondering, Maria, if you have thoughts on, on that question. Uh, I know that the families, uh, sometimes the, the parents, they really don't know when the kids really are, are, are trying to have that, that kind of need that, uh, need, they, that, they have those needs. But I think the schools are doing pretty good, the social workers and, and when families get connected with the schools and they really talk to them and making sure like uh, they, they have to work as a team, the schools are doing great. But I think it's, a, it's about the team work, parents and, and the school system, they need to work. And in Central, we have a different workshops and everything, how to really make sure like a parents, they feel comfortable to go and, and connect with the schools and, and tell the, the teachers how they, they have to approach these situations to, to make sure like a, for the goodness of the, of the child. And uh, yeah, but I think the schools are doing great, but they need to know, they, they, if they don't notice the background or something, so... They are so busy with too many kids, but I think it's our job as a community to, to go and face those, uh, those situations as a parents to go to the school and really talk to the, the teachers, the social worker and, and people who are there. And, and I know they, they, they are really so open to really help them, but they need to know. They, they, they are not musicians to find out like, oh, this child needs more help or need more mental health or not. But yeah, it's, it's about teamwork. I just want to second what Maria said and then and then also just kind of draw a point that I think the the school counselor to student ratio in Minnesota is about 700 to 1 and so because of that and because of what Maria touched on just how much is going on at, at schools at any given point I think it um, it just really highlights the need for 
community organizations and the role for community organizations because schools just can't do this kind of work alone. Um, and, and I think we today have had the opportunity to hear from a couple of the organizations who are doing that culturally specific work um, that I think it's, it's just really difficult for schools to do. But I do agree with Maria that that connection is really important as well. Thanks. We have another question from Jolene. I think that um, many of us who've worked with or had uh, you know, youth and teens at home, they can be an enigma. They can be hard to sometimes you know, understand or, or figure out. Um, maybe we're fearful or uncomfortable uh, on how to approach them. How do we connect with them? I, I heard that word connecting, feeling connected to their families, their community um, as being so central to this issue. And just wanted to know, like, what advice might you give parents or teachers right now and how they could work with youth and children? Um, I would say just keep in an open mind so that you could build trust with them. And once that trust is built, youth will be able um, to approach you and talk to you about anything and ask you questions if they feel like you have like to offer a safe and judgment free um, space to them. So I think that's um, that's key. Uh, if they feel like um, they're going to be judged, they're not going to approach you. So just keeping an um, open mind and not um, not jumping the gun and, and like not um, jumping to conclusions or uh, feeling like, uh, to ha and having them feel like oh they're doing a bad thing just um, building that trust to so that they can come to you with anything um, I think it's very very important to be patient and to be present for teens uh, to understand difficult behavior may, may indicate that teens are looking for attention and because they need to feel connected. And then uh, again, it's like a be patient and uh, be present for them. Can I, I wanna pop in and ask Maria, if you, if you have an example of maybe as someone who works with the adults um, focusing on youth, if you have an example um, of maybe an aha moment from an adult that you worked with just around under, better understanding a young person? Uh, you know what, I, I have worked with too many parents when they really are, when they find out that they, they are the ones who they are have the, having the root of the problem, and it's when they made the aha moment to really help their kids to feel connected. Because when the kids really are trying to really misbehave or doing something like, oh, why the child is doing this? It's because they really are trying to, to attract like, hey, mom, I'm here. I'm here. I need your help. I, I feel insulated. I feel alone. And uh, But I think sometimes the root of this problem is the, is the parents. Because when parents are feeling so anxiety, insecure, they are transmitting all of that when the, and the kids feel that. And when the parents, they realize that uh, is the connection is when they really, the kids say, they go like, okay, I feel more, more secure. I feel like I belong. This place is mine. And, and they, they reflect that in, in their school and in their own house about the uh, communication and feel more, more safe. Yeah, thanks. I, I appreciate that. And I think Dan had a question. I feel like just gets at this another layer. It really has like the same vein of, you know, I think his perspective is from school, but I think this, or, or sort of an educational setting, but I think it transcends across home as well. And just really as adults, you know, how can we better communicate with our young people so that they feel heard, whether it's at home or in a school setting, and how do we help them appreciate themselves? You know, uh, self-esteem and self-doubt, I think is at every corner. And so, how do they understand that their work, that what they do is important and how do we help them in that, in that journey and to value themselves? Just a small question. <laughs> Amina, would you like to start with that one? Yeah, um, I think um, encouragement and support, feel, if they feel like they're being supported, I think that goes a long way and it will help them be more confident in what they're doing and 
Um, yeah, I think I, I, I would say encouragement and support. Yeah, and that, and that feels like, you know, maybe it circles back to a lot of what you were talking about of being, allowing them to, to hear what they're saying and um, allowing that space that you listen or not maybe judgmental um, or put your perspective over it. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has a, a thought, maybe Maria looks like you're, you're going to jump in on that too. Yeah, I think it's, it's about uh, making them like uh, they are very, uh, they are, they are great person they are very smart making them like a uh, making them feel not feel respect them the, respect their space the way how they they approach things and and be patient for them and, and really as a parents and in community we have to make and ask questions to understand exactly what they are what they are having or what they are what are bringing to the the community or they are so bright they they really can do a lot of things that but we need to show them respect and the trust that we have for them because if they don't feel trust they don't feel respected it will be close always so and, and we need if we need to heal our community and to really be for them and to feel them safe they need to feel like they are respected in a safe, loyal place. Thanks. Um, we have one more question. I think, hopefully I'm pronouncing this uh, correctly, but from Tineel, or Tineel. Um, and you know, her question is really about, are, we, are there any shared learnings that we're getting from schools on mental health? And maybe we can broaden that question to be, you know, are there any sort of best practices that we're seeing, whether it's coming out of schools or your programs or within um, community-based programs that we're, that we're hearing are working and might be new approaches or just approaches that are, are broadening out and people are engaging in maybe more often than they were previously? Now, what's effective? Carolina, I'm wondering if you would wanna kick this question off. Um, sure. I think um, best practices uh, that we hear a lot and that we learn a lot from what um, we from community members is a strength based focusing and concentrating efforts on that part of the resilience in youth. I think it sounds easy, but I think in the day to day, and I think Amina and Maria mentioned it, is just focusing if it's in the context of the school system, if it's in the context of the family, in the context of any other setting with the youth is, what, what can you highlight of that strength to empower that youth? Um, I think as a, as, a, as a sort of evident base, uh, and I, I think and we can comfort, comfortably, I can comfortably say that is we, we should hold like a day-to-day -day mirror into how we are highlighting that resilience and that um, those strengths in that youth. And we're just that mirror. And basically the mirror will just highlight the best things that those, those the community, the youth are showing to us. And I mean, if we identify areas for growing, uh, that will be from that perspective. Hey, these are the areas that you can actually grow more. Uh, but I think it is definitely a change in perspective of how we're not saying these are the things that you're so bad about. These are the things that you are not really doing a great job in and, and then show it in a different perspective. So I think anything, any practice that actually highlights those strengths and focus on the resilience are going to actually have wonderful outcomes. And I'm very confident that that's the way to go. Thanks, I appreciate that. Maybe we'll we'll do one last question. I always think it's, this is a heavy topic and I think it's really great to, to end with, you know, hope and positivity. So um, what is maybe one thing that you've seen in your work that gives you energy and hope for the, for the future? Um, for me, it's definitely um, seeing youth that I work with evolve and grow into such amazing young adults. Um, as I mentioned in the past year, with with um, involved youth, and they were involved in a couple of projects that they were leading, and one of them was um, 
educating their peers, other youth about the dangers of vaping. And some of them, some of the things that they need to do was needed to do for the project as a project activity was community engagement through presentations about vaping. And um, most of them were like scared, not confident in their public speaking. Um, and and after they have done the community engagement presentations and the project ended, they were a lot more confident in their public speaking. And um, they told me that their confidence has grown. They feel like they can tackle anything and everything. Um, so definitely watching that change is just so beautiful to me and um, it makes me proud of them. So that's definitely something that keeps me going. Maria or Carolina. Okay. Um, one thing, oh, wow. I think there are too many things, but thinking in one thing is like, okay, uh, we have to stay connected and humble. All we are in the same community. What with affects me, it affects you. What I can change uh, and what you can change for, for good will be reflected tomorrow in our future generations. Our future is in our hands. If we do something together now for things as a community, we can have a better future for all. Uh, at Centro, Tyrone Guzman, uh, we are a great team. We support each another and that gives me the energy to, to help and support with love and respect uh, the families who come looking for help. Well, thank you um, to all of you for all of your, your work that you do tirelessly like day in and day out in this area. It's so important and I wanna know how much it's appreciated and, and thank you for sharing it with us today and highlighting some of your learnings and hope and just best practices that we can all you know, carry forward. So uh, thank you very much. I also wanna thank all of our attendees today um, for you know, asking such great questions. I think that's what really makes these uh, valuable sessions and really lets us dig into some great um, deep conversation. So um, let's go to the next slide. And I just wanted to take a couple of minutes very quickly here at the end to close this out and ask you know, that you're invited to join us at United Way to support thriving communities and positive change by making a gift, subscribing to our advocacy alerts, volunteering, or joining one of our giving communities. And you can find more information about these opportunities on our website, along with our ongoing career and future readiness efforts that directly support innovative youth programs initiatives like you heard here today. Um, and as Liz mentioned, I, I wanna also articulate if you or someone you know is in crisis, they can always call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline or speak to someone 24 seven by calling 1-800-273-8255. I know that was shared in the chat earlier as well. Um, why don't we go to the next slide? So again, just a huge thank you to our speakers, our attendees for being with us here today and your continued support. Together we can make and we are making a difference. Um, as mentioned, a recording of this event will be made available on our website next week. And then lastly, before we wrap up today's session, I'd like you to invite you to consider a commitment to live inclusively every day. I commit to be intentional and in living inclusively. I commit to spending more time getting to know myself and understanding my culture. It is in understanding myself that I'm better positioned to understand others. I will acknowledge that I don't know what I don't know, but I will not use what is unconscious as an excuse. I will be intentional in exposing myself to difference. If I don't know, I will ask. If I'm asked, I will assume positive intent. Most importantly, I will accept my responsibility in increasing my own knowledge and understanding. I commit to speaking up and speaking out, even when I am not directly impacted, for there is no such thing as neutrality in the quest for equity, justice, and inclusion. I will strive to accept and not just tolerate, respect, even if I don't agree, and be curious, not judgmental. I commit to pausing and listening. I will be empathetic to the experiences and perspectives of my others. I will use my privilege positively and get comfortable with my own discomfort. I commit to knowing, getting, and doing better than I did yesterday, keeping in mind 
My commitment to live inclusive, inclusively is a journey and not a destination. So with that, I'd like to thank again, all of you for attending today's session and have a great day.